King Charles II of England signed on the 4th of March, 1681, the Great Charter, granting Pennsylvania to William Penn. The 19th section of the charter from Charles II empowered William Penn to erect any parcel of land into manors. On the 18th of June, 1741, Thomas Penn, son of William, signed an order for the survey of the Manor of Mask on the branches of Marsh Creek, Lancaster County, to contain about 30,000 acres. And here we see a map of the Manor of Mask superimposed on a modern map of Adams County. And beginning in the southeast corner, it goes west for about six miles and turns northeast of the village of Fairfield out to about uh, Keckler's Hill on Route 34 north of uh, Gettysburg and then turns south again back to the point where it started. And you can see that the borough of Gettysburg is indeed um, almost all of the Gettysburg battlefield is in the manner of mask. Surveyors immediately began to lay out the manor lines, but were met with considerable resistance by the existing settlers within the proposed manor on account of the possible loss of their real property and the improvements made thereon, to the extent that the surveyors were driven off of the land, and we suspect with uh, shotguns and pitchforks. It was not until 1765 that an agreement was made between the Penns and the settlers for the sale slash purchase of the land. In 1766, the lines were finally established and the manor was found to contain 43,500 acres and the allowance of 6% for roads and so forth. The manor was named for an estate in Yorkshire, England belonging to Anthony Lowther Esquire, who was married to Margaret Penn sister of William Penn. The selling terms uh, of by the, with Penn's was at the same price as the other lands within the Indian Purchase Supra, that is 15 pounds, 10 shillings per 100 acres, or at the U.S. equivalent of $2.66 to the pound, computes to $41.23 per 100 acres. And this information comes to us from a view of the land laws of Pennsylvania by Sargent in 1838 and the histories of York, Cumberland, and Adams County in 1888. Now, many years later, the Adams County Historical Society instituted a project whereby people who could prove that their land lay within the manor mask would be able to get a plaque that they could display on their property that proved that. So this is plaque number two, which was issued to the Horner Farm uh, in uh, the 1990s. And then uh, we also have a certificate that we received from the uh, Historical Society designating our land as tract number 74 in the uh, manner of mask. At the outset, there was not a common agreement between the Penns of Pennsylvania and the Calverts of Maryland as to where the boundary was between their two provinces. The Penns and the Calverts were not the only parties concerned with the boundary dispute. The British government had, for many years, and with active urgings, looked with disfavor on the unwillingness of the two sides to resolve their differences. Finally, in large part, responding to the tensions of the mid-1730s, King George II issued an order on the 25th of May, 1738, directing both parties to appoint commissioners to fix the, quote, provisional and temporary limits between the two provinces till the boundaries shall be finally settled, end of quotation. Beginning in December, 1738, commissioners and surveyors worked together into the spring of 1739, drawing the line westward from Philadelphia until they had extended it for some 88 statute miles, thus establishing the temporary line of 1739. Now, the following several sentences come to us from an extensive study of the Manor of Mask, which was done by Professor Charles Gladfeller of the Adams County Historical Society and his assistant, Arthur Weiner. The widely held and long persisting notion that until many years later, people did not know where the boundary line was and that it shifted from time to time has no basis whatsoever in fact. The famous Mason-Dixon line, which marked the permanent boundary between Pennsylvania and Maryland was something of an anticlimax. 
drawn along the southern boundary of what is now Adams County in August 1765, but not proclaimed until 1774, the Mason-Dixon line was about 1,600 feet or less than one-third of a mile south of the temporary line of 1739. And this, as we said, is from the studies of Charles Gladfelder and Arthur Wiener in 1992. Old deeds in the possession of the present owners and their legal description read as follows. The 1789 and 1796 deeds begin, start beginning at a post in the temporary line between the states of Maryland and Pennsylvania. The 1802 deed reads beginning at stones in the temporary line. Whether stones or a post, we may come to the conclusion beyond any reasonable doubt that the southern boundary of the Horner Farm was one and the same with the temporary line of 1739. Now early on we have established two significant historical aspects of the Horner Farm. That is that it was part of the historic manner of the mask and secondly that it was one and the same with the temporary line of 1739 between the provinces of Pennsylvania and Maryland. The earliest name we can associate with the property that eventually became known as the Horner Farm is that of James Hall in 1741. What rights Hall had to the property other than squatter's rights is not fully understood at this time. But whatever rights Hall had were assigned to one Charles Vance in 1765 the oldest name to be ascribed on any of the deeds in the possession of the present owners. The chain of title records that the property changed five times until it was purchased by Alexander Horner in 1802. And we see starting with James Hall in 1741 and then whatever rights he had were transferred to Charles Vance in 1765 446 and three quarters acres and 30 pounds to Edmund Physic, the province of Pennsylvania for a survey, which we'll see in a few minutes. There was always a question about what the acreage was, or whether it was 446 acres or 380 acres. There was always a 60 acre part that was in the question. The next owner was Benjamin McKinley in 1772. And he went bankrupt and the property was conveyed to the sheriff of Adams County, uh, York County, who bought it to, to satisfy Benjamin's indebtedness. Then the next owner is William Stewart in 1775 for 509 pounds. Then Barnabas McSherry in 1789, and that's the earliest of the deeds that we have in our position. Then John McCullen in 1796 for 378 acres for 1,075 pounds. And then Alexander Horner in 1802 for 381 acres at 2,300 pounds. Now this is a, co a copy of a survey which was done by Charles Vance in 1765 of the land which eventually became known as the Horner Farm. And starting in the southeast corner again and going along the province line between Pennsylvania and Maryland and then turning north and angling back to the place of beginning, 441 uh, acres. The wrangling over ownership of lands in the manner of mass continued off and on throughout the 18th century and nearly into the 19th. One impasse after another led to dead ends. Finally, about 1797, they tried another course of action which produced acceptable and prompt results. They named the Reverend John Black and Alexander Cobain as their representatives to meet in Philadelphia with the pen agent Edmund Physick for the purpose of working out another compromise by the terms of which the second standoff between the Penns and the Marsh Creek settlers could be ended. On the 4th of February, 1797, their attorney, Physic, signed lengthy articles of agreement between John and Richard Penn on the one part and settlers on part of the tract of land commonly called or known by the manor mask on the other part. The articles of agreement contained six major provisions the fourth of which was the manor residents agreed to engage Moses McLean to, quote, procure a complete general draft showing each of the said settlers' lots and to deliver such a general plan to the Penns on or about April 1st, 1798. 
End of quotation. The Pens agreed to pay McLean for his work. There is indisputable evidence that Moses McLean prepared the complete general draft which the agreement called for. Obviously, Edward McPherson did not find it when he did extensive work on the Manor of Mask in the 1870s and 1880s, nor were the present writers, Gladfeller and Wiener, any more successful in their search a century later. Had they found the McLean map, their work, and its accompanying documents probably would not have been prepared. McLean presented a bill for over $800 for his general draft, a sum which the pen agent was surpri not surprisingly was unwilling to pay. Both sides agreed to refer the dispute to other surveyors who, in 1805, awarded McLean the sum of $150. Moses McLean was a practical man. His work may have been worth $800 but he was a practical man too, and he settled for what he thought he could get, and that was $150. Now we will have to step back 40 plus years to 1760, which was about the year two brothers, David and Robert Horner, emigrated from County Antrim, Ireland, on 600 acres in Mount Joy Township, then a part of York County, on land they had purchased from the heirs of William Penn. The oldest of immigrant David's sons, Alexander, purchased 381 acres of property in Cumberland Township in 1802 in what was then Adams County, which had been established in 1800. Alexander Horner was twice married. By his first wife, he had fathered six children. His wife had died and he remarried to a widow who brought two children of her own from her previous marriage and she and Alexander then had four more children, two adults and 12 children of various ages of, uh, all lived on the Horner property in a two-room log structure with a loft just to the west of where the homestead house would be located near a never-failing spring, the source of drinking and cooking water for the Horners for the next 100 years. Now, my older sister, says that she can remember when my father plowed up that field that you could see the footprint of where that cabin was located. I never saw it, but she claimed that she did down across the bank uh, in the field, which uh, it was west of where the homestead house would be constructed. We are inclined to believe that the homestead house was constructed by Alexander and his now teenage sons over a period of years with some outside help. Clay was dug from one of the fields and the bricks were fired on the property by a portable kiln. Up to 50 years ago, a depression in one of the fields indicated where the clay was obtained. The house completed in 1919 and we have a dated brick on the west side of house indicating DC 1819. That's how we have established the date that the house constructed. It consisted of four large rooms on the south side and six smaller rooms configured into an L in the back building. It is not known if the main house and the back building were constructed at the same time. There is a compelling evidence which to show that perhaps they were, and other equal compelling evidence to show that perhaps they were not. A summer kitchen was added, detached from the main house, the date of which is unknown. Now this is the oldest, one of the two oldest photographs we have of the homestead. And we think it dates from around 1800, but we don't know for sure. This shows the uh, homestead house after it was constructed in 1819 and the uh, a detached summer house. Looking over here, just past the foliage of the tree, we can see the end of the barn, which was constructed in 1840, and an old wagon shed, which was replaced by a modern building in 1916. We can see a huge swamp oak tree here, which was taken down by the power company in 1940, and in which both my father and my mother recorded it in their daily diaries. And if you look very carefully, we can see a well-worn path down along the bank here, which was a path tried by the people from the main house coming down to the spring to get their water until the uh, a, a well was drilled up near the main house in 1913.
This is a modern view of the house from the southwest corner. And if you look very carefully, you can see at the northwest corner of that window, there is a brick which is darker than the ones around it. And that's the date brick which we saw just a few minutes ago indicating the date of 1819. When the Horners purchased the property, an old log barn existed, which proved to be inadequate for their farming operations. So a much larger barn was raised in 1840. Now we have two dates here, and this is on the inside of one of the barn doors, and it reads, I. Leitner, August 27th, 1840. In our research, we found that there was an Isaac Leitner who lived in the area at that time, but uh, we don't have any evidence that he was a carpenter or a barn builder. And we always had some lingering doubts as to whether that was really the date that the barn was built or whether somebody came along later and just wrote in his name and date. But then in 2016, we found another inscription inside the barn, which very plainly reads AS 1840. So then we were convinced that uh, 1840 is the correct date for the construction of the barn. Now, oral family history indicates that at the time the barn builders knew there were already barns in the area that were 100 feet long and wanted their barn to be the longest in the area, the plans were slightly altered so their barn would measure 100 feet 6 inches, which is what it measures today. The barn is now 176 plus years of age and is still used for the same purpose for which it was constructed in the first place. Namely, the shelter of livestock, repository of hay, straw, and various grains, and storage of farm equipment. Now this image shows the barn from the northeast corner. And you can see that there is a granary at one end of the barn. And originally there was a granary of equal size at the other end of the barn. But generations ago, the wall over here, fell, the stone wall fell down, and rather than rebuild it, they just took it away and put boards up on the side of the barn where the uh, uh, wall had been. Now you can see, uh, get an idea some here of the length of the barn. We can count six barn doors here, two barn doors for each barn floor. And... Uh, the most barns were of such length that they could only get two barn floors. But this barn, because of the fact that it was so long, they were able to find three barn uh, floors with six barn doors. Now we can see a photo of the barn from the southwest corner. And here we can get uh, a better idea of the length of the barn. Now the barn is not particularly wide. It's not particularly high, and it doesn't have a steep roof, but it is long, as this photo well shows. Now to the left of this photo is another one of the four old buildings on the farm, Horner Farm property. This is a wagon shed, which celebrated its 100th birthday in 2016, a modern wagon shed built to replace one which was uh, originally uh, down here below the barn. So these four old buildings, the uh, house, the summer kitchen, the barn, and the wagon shed now have uh, reached a total of 676 years. Now we've seen the uh, outside of the barn. Now let's take a look at some of the things inside the barn. This is the fish photo, which is in the divider between two of the grain bins and the granary that we saw in the uh, previous uh, slide. This is a sort of source of great mystery to us because we don't know who drew it. We don't know when it was drawn. We don't know what the purpose of it was. As far back as I can remember, which is 80 plus years now, it doesn't look any different today than it did at the time that I first uh, saw it. The materials that were used, uh, we just don't have the answers to those questions. But it's always been there. And I guess...